technology. While he was earning his degree in chemical engineering, he also developed an interest in evolutionary biology. Deciding to switch fields, he uh, joined the Department of Biology, a PhD program at the University of Rochester. And in Dr. Ike Bush's lab, he studied the evolutionary origins of retrotransposable elements. He followed this by his postdoc in uh, the Fred Hutch Cancer Center in Seattle in Steve Hanikoff's lab, where he studied the evolution of centromeric histones while opening his own lab in 2003, also at Fred Hutch. Dr. Malik's lab is interested in studying evolutionary cases of genetic conflicts, the mechanisms employed to resolve these cases, and the consequences they bear. For this purpose, his lab examines examples of rapidly evolving proteins like the centromeric protein, uh, SID, the meiotic drivers like the WTF genes in yeast, and mobile genetic, genetic elements in Drosophila and primates. Though Dr. Malik is a big fan of selfishness in the genomes, he was very generous in accepting our invite to be the keynote speaker. And today, he will be telling us more about his work on genetic conflicts during meiosis and the origins of species. Dr. Malik. Thank you, Minka. So uh, thanks very much for inviting me to all the organizers. Uh, this has actually been one of the most stimulating uh, workshops that I've actually been to. It really feels like a workshop you're hearing from experts. And up until this point, this has been a fantastic day. <laughs> so because I think there's beer after this, and there's a chance everybody's going to filter out. So if you could just take like five seconds and thank all the organizers, especially the trainees who put this together, that'd be great. Let's do that now. Just to really emphasize how diverse this uh, symposium is, you'll see that my talk, uh, for instance, uses cartoons as the high resolution crystal structures um, compared to what Dorothy said. But also in terms of athletic prowess, Dorothy was the captain of the basketball team, and I struggled to make it onto my high school soccer team. And I only made it on because I was the 11th volunteer. So I was basically played goalie uh, for my entire career, uh, short-lived career as a soccer player. All right. Um, so as Mega pointed out, my lab is very interested in one form of adaptation. We've heard about different types of adaptation today. Uh, for instance, adaptation to a particular chemical, pollutants, et cetera, shade. Uh, what I'm actually talking about is an, a sort of a cycle of adaptation and counter-adaptation that is sort of ceaseless. And that what makes it easy for us to identify. Uh, this idea of genetic conflicts really comes to uh, us from the fictional character, the Red Queen, from Lewis Carroll's book in which the Red Queen um, says to Alice that in Wonderland, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. In the context of the book, it's one of the many memorable lines, but this was actually seized upon as a really nice way to coalesce a number of ideas that have been percolating in evolutionary biology and formalized as a Red Queen hypothesis by Lee Van Valen. And so in a way, I sort of try to think about this as the second incarnation of Darwinian thought in evolutionary biology. Uh, Darwin had primarily concerned himself with the type of adaptation that we've heard about already in this uh, symposium, which is about adaptation to ecological niches and how organisms within a population could actually be more or less successful when the environment changed. But what Lee Van Valen pointed out was that actually a large part of that ecosystem was made up of competing species that were competing with your choice of organism for the same fitness space. And in turn, your cycle of adaptation would spur a cycle of counter-adaptation on the part of your competing species. So the only way for you to maintain yourself in a particular ecosystem is to run these cycles of constant adaptation. Because if you did not, you ran the risk of being driven to extinction. So he was primarily concerned with adaptation in the ecological sense in prey and predator populations between snow hares and leopards, and the cyclical episodes of boom and bust cycles as prey populations and then predator populations increased. But it's actually a very easy analogy to sort of stretch that. Here's my first high resolution structure between uh, arms races of host and viral proteins. So in this cartoon example, particularly in innate immunity, antiviral proteins uh, sense particular aspects of the viral proteins and use those to mount a successful response intracellularly. And if they are successful, this viral protein will lead to the extinction of the virus within the cell and eventually from the organism. 
because viruses have access to large amounts of mutational space, they will rapidly explore space such that they can avoid being antagonized by the antiviral protein, which spurs a much slower cycle of adaptation on the host site to reestablish its antagonism of the virus et cetera. The number of arrows simply indicate the fact that the viruses have a huge advantage in this one-to-one -one interaction, but what's not listed on this cartoon is the fact that we have a dedicated number of nearly 150 genes whose only job it is to interrogate an incoming virus into the cell. And for a virus to be successful, even through one cycle of infection, it needs to win the entire gauntlet, run the entire gauntlet of these antiviral proteins. For the host to be successful, it actually only needs to win one. And that sort of normalizes the math somewhat in terms of trapping the virus in these epistatic valleys. Uh, for the purposes of today's talk, what I'd like to impress upon you is that this conflict of adaptation and counter-adaptation is really driven by the fact that when the host is successful, the virus is not, and when the virus is successful, the host is not. So by, by, by sort of definition, one party is always losing, and therefore there's always going to be an evolutionary advantage to be gained by innovation, either on the host or the virus side. There's not sort of a kumbaya resting moment where both of them can like live happily ever after. Now that's not true in all cases, because viruses can co-evolve, particularly if they've actually coexisted with the host uh, but today's talk is really about pathogenic viruses that elicit a host cost. So what labs like mine do is look backwards in time at the genomic signatures of this adaptation as trapped in the host and viral sequences to try to decipher how these arms races might have played out. A uh, very simple way to do this, uh, it's a little bit late in the day to sort of introduce concepts of molecular evolution, but uh, a very straightforward way to sort of look at this is that uh, mutation has introduced two types of changes uh, without really any heed to what those are, they could be silent or synonymous or replacement changes that alter the amino acid in this sort of triplet uh, codon. Natural selection, of course, pays a lot of heed to the nature of these changes and can decide whether to tolerate some or eliminate others. So for instance, if you're looking at a very conserved protein or a conserved part of a protein, what you're effectively doing is making a mathematical calculation that no mutations have been tolerated, even though given the amount of time that has elapsed, lots of mutations must have been sampled by the random process of mutation generation. So effectively, you're looking at positions that are conserved in a protein alignment as a proxy for how selection has acted to purify the population, purging it of all of these deleterious uh, amino acid replacements that must have occurred. Basically, what you're using is high evolutionary conservation as a proxy for functional importance. That's the basis for doing reverse genetics. If you go to your advisor and you tell him, there's this completely unconserved site, I'd like to mutate it to abrogate function, you'd probably fail your qualifying exam. That's because we use high evolutionary conservation as a proxy for functional importance. But we make the mistake often to say that things that are not conserved must not be important. What I'd like you to take away from today's talk is there are many do protein domains and residues in which the apparent rate of amino acid change actually exceeds what you'd expect based on silent changes. And that occurs because selection has actually acted positively to accelerate the rate of amino acid changes in those particular uh, residues because those were deemed beneficial in the context that they actually occurred. So what we're looking for is just like high evolutionary conservation, this constant relentless innovation is a proxy for functional importance, but this one is intimately tied to genetic conflicts. So if you were to sort of go back to my cartoon example, and if all of the fate of this host virus interaction was dictated by binding affinity, you could make a proxy to say that, okay, we do not expect this rapid evolution to be randomly distributed over the surfaces of these two proteins. We expect it to be concentrated on those residues that maximally affect the binding interaction between these two proteins. So armed with nothing more than that simple hypothesis, we asked whether we could simply ask where positive selection is occurring on the surface of the protein from an evolutionary standpoint and use that to infer host virus interaction interfaces. Could that simple metric of binding interaction and escape from binding interaction be sufficient to drive the evolution we need to decipher the biochemistry? And uh, we've done this for a number of cases, but I'd like to sort of present just a very brief vignette about a protein called MXA that was actually discovered almost three decades ago because of its potency in defeating uh, influenza. And because it's an anti-influenza innate antiviral gene, there's been so much attention focused on it uh, 
But until very recently, despite a crystal structure, we knew very little about its specificity domains. So what we did was we sequenced MXA from simian primates. It's a 660 amino acid dynamin-like protein. Uh, but, and actually 85% of that is completely frozen in evolution, which means you would look at that protein and you would go, that's a really well-conserved protein. Yet within that milieu of purifying selection, there are 12 positions shown here by these triangles that are so rapidly evolving that no two primate species share the exact same residues at all of these positions. So they meet our criteria of positive selection, and when we overlay them on the crystal structure, you can see they're non-randomly distributed over the surface of the protein. In particular, I'd like to draw your attention to loop L4, which is drawn here in my artist's rendition because it was unstructured in the crystal structure, which is actually the biggest hotspot for rapid evolution or positive selection. And so when we look at what is the phenotypic consequence of this, we see that, in fact, this rapid change is meaningful. So here are human uh, MXA protein shown in increasing dosage, and this is an influenza-related virus called Togoda virus. As you increase the amount of human MXA, you get lower and lower fitness of this particular virus. But at very high levels of expression of African green monkey MXA, recall that this is more than 90% identical, we essentially have no restriction. At this point, the biochemists in the audience would be itching to do kind of a chimeric analysis, the evolutionary biologist hopefully would be like me and think about the minimum number of experiments you need to kind of get this paper accepted. And so what we did was we said, well, let's just focus on the most positively selected parts of the protein and swap it between African green monkey and human. So here's a human MXA backbone with the African green monkey loop L4 residues that are rapidly evolving. That's actually only five residue changes. And you lose all that restriction. And here's the reciprocal change, where by swapping in the least conserved parts of the protein, we have effectively swapped the specificity of that protein and allowed it to basically take...
with sperm binding proteins, whereas the sperm binding proteins are all under competition to increase their avidity and interaction with the egg. So here's a case where it's the same interaction. It's totally essential for both the sperm and the egg to have this interaction, but yet the paradigm of binding affinity is very similar to what I showed you with the host and the pathogen. Another very ex excellent example of where you would not expect to see a conflict, but you do, because mitochondria are, of course, the example, classic example of symbiosis between an ancient bacteria and the original eukaryote, comes because mitochondria are often inherited uniparentally, which means that, for instance, in many plant populations, mitochondrial genomes are not under direct natural selection for male fitness at all, because males are a dead end for most mitochondria. So frequently, they can actually acquire mutations that will actually sterilize the male flowers and essentially present the uh, plants with the opportunity to produce twice the number of female flowers, thereby increasing by twofold the mitochondrial transmission success, even though it's actually coming at the expense of the plant fitness. So here we have a conflict between the DNA encoded in the mitochondria versus the DNA that's encoded in the nucleus, which is totally reliant on males in order to be, be completely in fish air in equilibrium. So it's actually still a controversial point whether this kind of selfish behavior exists in animal mitochondria. There are, there's very little actually direct evidence that that's the case. But nonetheless, if you look at proteins that are completely essential, encoded in the nucleus, but work in the mitochondria, including the RNA polymerase, they're just as rapidly evolving as some of the immunity proteins we see in Drosophila, suggesting that this is also a situation where there might be, in fact, some sort of arms race going on. So the thing that I'd like to focus on for the rest of the talk here uh, is meiosis, because I feel like meiosis is one of those absolute uh, battlegrounds for conflict, as Alan said, because there are lots of opportunities for competition. Um, we tend to think about meiosis as this very boring process in which a heterozygous diploid individual will give rise to two gametes of different genetic sort of disposition. And now, if you, if you think about this, the big A and the little a allele can compete in two ways. It can actually compete at the haploid stage. You could have a sperm-specific advantage conferred by the big A behavior, which outcompetes the small a sperm. Or, more traditionally, the big A allele can confer an advantage to the organism that inherits it and therefore increase in the population. This is the way Darwinian fitness is supposed to work. Fitter alleles increase in population and eventually take over. And so what makes this more interesting is that this is not always the case, because you can have a situation where the big A allele can win, not because it's the fitter allele, but because it's able to outcompete the little a allele during meiosis, even though it's actually lowering the net fitness of the organism that inherits it. So now we are in the situation where what's best for the gene is actually not best for the genome, and that's where selfishness comes in, because you're essentially in a conflict between some components of the genome versus the rest of the genome. So if we, before I go into meiosis, uh, I've been reminded several times, I shouldn't assume that all of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so let's start with the process of mitosis. I do work at a cancer research center, so we are very interested in mitosis. You go through millions of mitosis every day. It's really important that that process is policed so you do not end up with chromosome segregation errors. For the most part, though, this is a highly boring process. There are exceptions. Chins in the room, so I have to be careful. The reason it's boring is because the products of mitosis are essentially genetically identical. So at the level of discrimination based on their DNA, there's nothing to discriminate one product from the other. In contrast, meiosis provides opportunities for competition because the products of meiosis are haploid, and different combinations of moms and dads chromosomes, which means they're not genetically identical. So in theory, if this was in plants or fungi or animals, all of these should have an equal opportunity to go on and become pollen or sperm or spores. But biology is a lot more interesting. In a number of different taxa, you can have a toxin gene that ends up on the red chromosome that basically acts by poisoning the maturation of the purple chromosome containing sperm, which means that even though you're a heterozygous male, the only sperm that you transmit to the next generation are the red chromosome containing ones. So that's a huge advantage, as you can imagine. For the red chromosome, things are pretty dire for the purple chromosome. Before we get into this even more, I'd just like to point out that this is not strictly meiotic drive, because this drive uh, 
is not taking place during meiosis. This is taking place subsequent to meiosis where you're discriminating between the products of meiosis and their ultimate fitness. But from a mathematical standpoint, it works out just as much as meiotic drive does. So this is, of course, bad for the purple chromosome, but you can imagine it's also bad for the rest of the genome. All the other chromosomes in that nucleus who just dropped 50% of their male fertility because of the selfish action of the red chromosome. So the only winner here is the red chromosome. Everybody else is a loser. So everybody else in the genome is going to be evolving uh, uh, methods to try to suppress this poison such that they can restore their own meiotic success and transmission. So a lot of these suppressors actually turn out to be RNAi-based sort of inhibition of expression. But what's really cool is that these poisons are completely multivarious, and they involve often completely essential processes like chromosome condensation, nuclear import, flagellar uh, maturation, et cetera, things that you would not suspect are under rapid evolution, but actually are under rapid evolution. And probably that, the reason for that is because of these cycles of uh, changes that are occurring. So a long time ago, uh, Steve Frank and Hurston Pawlikowski pointed out that this process of myotic drive and suppression is rapid enough. For instance, Drosophila simulans has three completely independent systems of myotic drive that you could actually separate two populations. And if these, for instance, occur on sex chromosomes, you could actually inherit a state where in crosses between these populations, you inherited both poisons but neither suppressor. And that would mean that these hybrids would be either sterile or inviable. So just the spontaneous acquisition of meiotic drive suppressor systems would be sufficient to create reproductive isolation ba barriers between what were previously one uh, population. Now, I should point out that this was not the ev evolutionary biology's favorite idea when it was uh, proposed, because there was absolutely no data. So of course, people piled on to these two groups of researchers saying how stupid they were and how completely off base were there. Like with many things, they were, of course, com almost completely right. It, in fact, it is becoming more and more apparent as we are uncovering reproductive isolation genes that these are, in fact, driven by genetic conflicts. But the problem and the reason this is, still remains a debate is the best places to study meiotic drive are actually in the field, in ecology. And the best places to study speciation, et cetera, are actually in the lab. And there's a little bit of a disconnect between doing kind of detailed studies about meiosis and detailed studies about speciation in the same organism. And that's what actually motivated Sarah Zanders, a former postdoc in my lab, to look at a model system in which she could hope to study speciation. So she studied uh, Fisionis, Schizosaccharomyces pombi, which is, uh, of course, a workhorse for genetics, including meiosis. But most of the world knows it as the yeast used to brew banana beer, for instance, in Africa. And it's 99.5% identical to this uh, strain called Schizosaccharomyces kombucha, which is actually the fungal constituent of the microbial mat in kombucha tea, which I'm sure people pay good money for, to my, completely mysterious to me. So they have the same number of chromosomes. They're 99.5% identical. You can make hybrid diploids, which are completely wild type in terms of their fitness. And yet these hybrid diploids are completely sterile, almost completely sterile. So despite this very, very short divergence, you have this dramatic drop in, in, in fitness of the hybrids in terms of fertility, which means that a reproductive barrier has been created. And so Sarah figured out that actually this reproductive barrier is on two accounts. Chromosome rearrangements have occurred such that meiotic recombination is actually disfavored because you would not inherit all the essential genes after meiosis. But this is where most natural studies would have stopped because they were said, well, there's a chromosomal rearrangement that explains the speciation phenotype. Sarah went a little bit further because she was able to completely cure the cr chromosome rearrangements using CRISPR technology and say, okay, if I now make them completely collinear, does the reproductive isolation disappear? And amazingly, it did not. It actually had a very small impact because what she discovered was there were multiple meiotic drive alleles that were basically present in these species that had gone undetected for a long time. So the first paper sort of talked about the possibility that there was a rampant meiotic drive, but we didn't know what it was. In a subsequent study, she identified the gene family called the WTF gene family as a potential meiotic drive gene. I should point out, I already hear Sniggers, we did not name this gene before. <laughs> uh, the, the, the reviewers of our paper really wanted us to rename it, but you know, it was in the genome database. Um, 
WTF is interesting because we were able to map a couple of loci that actually completely uh, showed that this is actually consistent with myotic drive. But the mystery about WTF is that a number of people have actually studied this. And the only thing we know about WTF is that it's exclusively expressed during meiosis. That's it. So what Sarah pointed out was like, okay, if this is the myotic drive gene, we should be able to do a couple of very simple genetic experiments. So this is a wild type cross. We shouldn't see sterility or myotic drive because these chromosomes are identical. But if you delete the WTF4 gene from one of the chromosomes, what we see now is a 50% spore viability. 50% of the spores in this ascus are killed. And the only ones that survive actually have the WTF wild type gene. Now, this is not actually sufficient to say that this is a myotic drive gene. I'm sure many of you are thinking WTF could be actually a spore essential gene. You know, if you basically are deleting it, you're essentially consigning this for death because it doesn't have the factor necessary to go through development. And in fact, if you delete it from both, if it's necessary for development, everybody should be dead. But if it's necessary for drive, everybody should live. And in fact, that's what happens. There is absolutely no phenotypic consequence to deleting both genes. Now, the irony is this experiment was actually done 10 years ago by the Fissionese people. When you ask, here's a gene family expressed exclusively during meiosis, your first inclination is not, let's test it as a heterozygote. You want to delete it, make a you know, homozygous diploid, and see what happens. And nothing happens. So you'd conclude, we don't know what the function is. But this only manifests as a heterozygote because that's when it has the advantage to kill all the chromosomes that do not inherit it. So WTF4 is, has no social redeeming value to fissionese whatsoever. It only exists because it's able to outcompete all the other chromosomes it encounters that do not have an equivalent allele that can cross protect. Um, the model for mitotic drive is shamelessly stole from bacteria, which actually encode these dual poison antidote systems, and except they deploy them now in meiosis and uh, fission yeast. So the idea is that you basically produce two products from this mitotic drive gene. One is a diffusible poison that can actually affect all spores, and the second is an antidote that's privately held only in the spore that actually is en encoding the gene. As a result, following meiosis, the poison can act on everybody, and it kills this spore, but this spore cannot be killed because it's encoding the antidote. Actually, it turns out that there are at least 60 known configurations of these toxin antidotes in bacteria. So in that re respect, WTF4 is not unique. What makes it unique, though, is both the poison and the antidote are expressed of the same gene. And this is why we were stuck for a very long time, because we could not figure out how is it possible? We thought about proteolytic cleavage and all those other mechanisms. But actually, it turns out it's simpler than that, which is that there are two different transcription initiation sites. Here's one transcription initiation site that initiates within this intron that actually ends up expressing a shorter protein that is the poison. And later in meiosis, you use a different transcription initiation site to make a longer version of the protein that effectively acts as a dominant negative to the poison, which is why it's the antidote. So what's really nice about this is that we can make separation of function mutations in the methionine codons and completely separate the uh, poison versus the antidote. As a result, what ends up is that you end up with this diffusible poison that's actually expressed early in meiosis and diffusible through the Golgi, uh, because these are transmembrane proteins, all throughout the ascus. But the uh, antidote, you can see, is only expressed in two out of the four, and those are the two spores that are going to survive. So what we have is this beautiful, completely insidious, but beautiful system of uh, simplicity in which you basically use this poison antidote system to get rid of the competition. What makes this really complicated is there's 27 of these in the fission yeast genome. And they are basically amplified by a process of duplication and diversification such that there's very little cross protection by antidotes of one WTF against the other. And that's why they actually persist. And that's why you have near complete reproductive isolation in crosses between multiple strains of what should be the exact same gene. I only emphasize this point because WTF seems to have landed from Mars. We have no homology to anything outside the fission yeast. Even all the fission yeast uh, species don't encode it. It could easily have been transferred by horizontal transfer, but it's evolving so rapidly that our ability to really detect where it came from is, is really uh, small. And yet this principle of poison antidotes acting is a really general way to have pervasive myotic drive. 
So I want to close my talk by actually telling you a little bit about female meiosis because I think female meiosis is even more interesting because at the end of female meiosis in plants and animals, only one out of the four products is going to be selected to be in the oocyte and the other three are going to be discarded as polar bodies. And so now the game is not about killing your brother's sperm, it's about outracing the other oocytes to get to whatever that preferred position is such that you are selected to the oocyte. So what we uh, suggested was because the, if this is happening at the centromeres, which is the predominant uh, place of interaction of the microtubule spindle, we could imagine that any kind of skew at meiosis 1, for instance, for the purple chromosome, could actually skew things such that the purple chromosome ends up in the preferred position in a non-Mendelian fashion, where it is inherited uh, more often than you'd expect. Now, what's really cool about this is this is strictly meiotic drive, because this is cheating that is taking place during chromosome segregation. You're actively taking advantage of the asymmetry of chromosome segregation in order to actually outcompete the competition. The other thing that's really cool about this is it's uh, fairly bloodless. What I mean by that is you've not really eliminated 50% of the gametes. You're producing exactly the same number of eggs. You simply skewed the genetic composition of those eggs to favor your own transmission. Indeed, there's actually very strong evidence that centromeric uh, loci can cheat. So, for instance, some of the data comes from our own species, where we have a few chromosomes with the centromere at the ends of the uh, chromosomes. These are called acrocentrics. And they can fuse at the centromeric regions to give rise to what we refer to as a Robertsonian fusion. These are now metacentrics with the centromere in the middle of this long chromosome. There is very little loss of genetic material here. There's a little bit of loss of RDNA, but there's a lot of redundancy of RDNA. So th there's no somatic defects associated with being a carrier of a Robertsonian. So we can ask, well, if you're a carrier, is there a transmission disadvantage? Which chromosomal set do you pass on to your progeny? Turns out in male meiosis, it's about the same. But in female meiosis, it's 60% of the time that you're passing on the non-wild type Robertsonian. In fact, the human chromosome 2 is a successful Robertsonian that has fixed in the species, which was a fusion of great ape acrocentric chromosomes at some point in our evolution. There is, of course, a cost to this, at least in Robertsonian terms, because 0.1% of the human population is a carrier of Robertsonian. That seems really small until you multiply that by 7 billion and counting, right? That's a lot of people with Robertsonian fusion chromosomes. And if you're a male, there's a three in four chance of suffering some fertility disadvantage because of a number of things, including the fact that you have unequal numbers of centromeres, so pairing is a problem. So what we have here is a situation of selfishness transmitting one chromosomal set during female meiosis, but the sons and the grandsons have this increased risk of infertility. So that's kind of the trade-off here. This is exactly the same kind of thing that's seen in plants, where a centromere expansion leads to a meiotic drive uh, allele in female meiosis, but the same allele is actually detrimental for male meiosis as well as for general viability. So the reason this is occurring in plants and animals is because centromeres uh, are actually defined not by sequence like they are in budding yeast, but even in this homogeneous array of satellite DNA where the heterochromatin and centromeric proteins sit, really determines what these boundaries between centromere and heterochromatin is going to be. Which means if you overexpress heterochromatin proteins, you can encroach into the centromere. And if you do the reverse, you can actually increase the centromere size. Which means this is a very labile, mass action sort of a dependent process. So what we proposed was that if you, this was the case, perhaps any kind of change at the DNA level, this could be recombination, nucleotide substitution, that could overlure centromeric proteins to this, chrom this chromosome versus all the other chromosomes, centromeric proteins being the predominant currency for cheating, would give this chromosome now an advantage. And that advantage would manifest in terms of increased transmission through female meiosis. But there must be a problem, because if this comes with uh, some sort of infertility in the male population, this is going to be now something that cannot really drive to fixation, because it's carrying with this, uh, this cost. So there are two ways to solve this problem you could actually revert back to the unselfish state. If you've been paying attention to my talk, you know that that'll never happen because you've essentially got a selfish advantage that is private, whereas the disadvantage is shared across all the population, right? So you would never give up your net selective advantage to be selfish. So the only way to solve this problem 
is for the proteins that essentially define the centromeres to change their DNA binding specificity such that they are no longer conferring the selfish DNA, the advantage it seeks in female meiosis. So the analogy can be made between centromeric DNA acting like a parasite that first invades a population by better binding a host protein, and then the host immune protein evolving away from this binding affinity to essentially get rid of the parasite. The only difference is what's on the right-hand side are centromeric DNA and centromeric proteins, both of them completely essential for every cell division. So they're collaborators in the essential process of chromosome segregation, yet this asymmetry in female meiosis also gives them the uh, chance to be competitors in terms of these genetic conflicts. So what's really nice is that this model can explain the unexpected rapid evolution of both centromeric DNA, which we've known for, for a very long time, but also the very rapid evolution of centromeric proteins, which is unexpected because these are completely essential, and yet in many species, they, they evolve just as fast as immunity proteins. Not at all what you'd expect, and that's what led us to sort of propose this model. Uh, when I was a postdoc with Steve Hanikoff, and that is close to the look he gave me when we did that. This seems like science fiction, but what's amazing is that half of this model has now been proven through elegant experiments in mouse oocytes, primarily by work that was done in Mike Lamson's lab, who showed that indeed recruitment of centromeric proteins is the basis for myotic drive in female meiosis. Expanded centromeric satellites do recruit more uh, centromeric proteins and therefore win in female meiosis. And finally, very uh, recent exciting work that these chromosomes are actually hijacking an inherent asymmetry of the spindle in female meiosis in order to orient to the winning position. So, which means that the left-hand side of this cartoon, as unbelievable as it is, is basically no longer a hypothesis. I think all the tenets have been met. What we still don't know, though, is what drives the evolution of the centromeric protein. Why is it deleterious for the host which forces the centromeric proteins to evolve? So that's what I'd like to tell you about and close my talk today. So we focused on one class of centromeric proteins, which are the centromeric histones, which are essentially replace histone H3 in these non-canonical centromeric nucleosomes that are only found at the centromeric regions. So these are the chromosomal arms packaged in the core canonical histones, very slowly evolving. These are the centromeric nucleosomes in which this H3 protein is actually a centromeric histone H3, and it is very rapidly evolving. In fact, it was the discovery of rapid evolution of centromeric histones that really drove this entire sort of uh, logical cascade. So it was really hard for us to imagine waiting a million years for the next amino acid evolution to take place. At least in Seattle, people frown on those kinds of thesis committees. So Ben Ross decided that instead of doing the forward evolution, he would do reverse evolution, essentially reverting the rapid evolution of centromere to a sort of pre-adapted state, hoping that that'll actually reveal some sort of deleterious effect, which will actually tell us what drove the evolution in the first place. Now, he actually was quite successful in a number of respects, but unfortunately, he had to end his thesis in 2015 BC, which is before CRISPR. So we, we basically were able to do a lot, but not the, like the perfect experiment we'd like to. And so uh, two technicians in the lab took on his mantle. So what Ben designed were three alleles. He recoded the melanogaster SID, which is the centromeric histone allele, just so that the codon bias is normalized. He also recoded the simulans allele to the same codon bias. These two species are the closest species we can basically check compared to melanogaster. So we're going the minimum number of distance that we can. Uh, contrast that with what Dorothy showed you with going as distantly in the past as possible. We could also use these sequences to reconstruct what must have been the melanogaster simulans ancestor down to the codon level and essentially present that as well. So we've got now three versions, the original melanogaster version, one from the wild type version from another species, and the ancestral version before these two species split off. And so we re-encoded all of these in a flag tag fashion back into the endogenous locus with, with CRISPR. Um, I'll just show you data from the MSA just for clarity, but just to sort of point out that this is, of course, identical because it's the original melanogaster protein coding gene. This is the ancestral gene, which is 11 amino acids different, and the simulans is 21 amino acids different out of a 225 amino acid protein. <laughs> 
So what do we find? Well, we took advantage of the enormity uh, of uh, awesomeness that balancer chromosomes and uh, Rosofla represent. I actually just started a project in mouse genetics, and my first question was, so what are the balancers that you use? And the blank look of my postdoc's face, oh my god. I don't know how you do it, Alex. I don't know how you do it. So balancer chromosomes are amazing because they have all these inversions, which means they're recombinationally protected from uh, introgressing with the wild type. They also carry recessive lethals. And in this case, they actually are carrying the wild type unmolested version of the SID gene, right? So that's like our wild type donor chromosome. We cross these heterozygotes with each other, and we should get three types of progeny. One that is homozygous for the recoded gene, so we can ask, how does this do? One that is carrying at least one copy of the original uh, balancer or wild type gene, and one that has both balancer chromosomes. This is dead because of all the recessive lethals carrying on it. So we expect a one to two Mendelian sort of ratio. And what's really nice is that we did see that for the melanogaster recoded genes, but we did not see that for the ancestor gene. So they were slightly off what you'd expect based on the Mendelian ratio. So we have a little bit of a nugget of information suggesting maybe something's going wrong with these ancestrally reconstructed versions. Um, so we said, okay, I just want to sort of make sure that all of you are on the same page to just show you the experiment in graphical form. So there are three sources of centromatic histone in a cross between a female and a male. There is a little bit of centromatic histone coming in on dad's genome. That's really important for centromere identity. There's some coming in from mom's genome, but there is a huge excess of centromatic DNA that's put in to the oocyte for all the subsequent rounds of embryonic mitosis, right? In terms of bulk, this is like 10,000 fold more than what's on the genomes of the mom's and dad's pronucleus. In a melanogaster, melanogaster cross, everybody lives. If this was not true, I'd have to shut my lab down. What we've shown you in the previous slide is if we take a heterozygous situation, we also get three types of progeny. And in fact, the heads are completely viable, but, but so are, amazingly, even these homozygous melanogaster flies that are actually all encoding the wrong version of the SID protein, right? I'm trying to put a positive spin on it, but this is not at all what I wanted to see. There was like very little of an effect, like a 10% effect. So I said, of course, You've got adults, there's going to be an infertility problem. That's what's driving the incompatibility. So we took males that were adults and we said, okay, if we cross those males to melanogaster females, maybe we see some male infertility. We did not. We did the reciprocal experiment where we took females that had the wrong recoded SID and crossed it with males. Now keep in mind here, the bulk of the SID protein in this cross is of the wrong type. So if there was going to be a problem, a lot of bets were like that this cross would not work. And these were fine. So what we concluded was that either paternal or maternal SIDMEL can uh, suffice for viability. But the really, the honest conclusion was there was no problem here, right? These recorded guys, the ancestor simulans guys, they were all perfectly fertile. And they seemed to be capable of producing viable progeny. So this is like when you have your favorite Netflix show and it ends with your hero jumping off at the end of the sixth season. Pretty much like how we felt, right? Like, oh my, this is not the ending I had in mind. But then we decided to cross these guys. Remember, these are completely fertile with these guys. So both parents only encoded the recoded guy. And when we did that, we got no survivors. Absolute 100% incompatibility where you, neither parent can provide the right centromeric histone from melanogaster. You have no survivors. So this actually means that there is both genetic versus epigenetic inheritance of centromere identity. Epigenetic because having either mom or dad provide the right centromeric histone information is enough to train the wrong centromeric histone to go to the right spot. But when neither one can train, you essentially end up with no good uh, progeny. These are the actual numbers. Uh, this is sort of just the conclusion I told you, um, where we have, for the very first time, evidence of the centromeric histone, this essential protein, uh, from an ancestor or from a sister species being incompatible with melanogaster. So these are the types of crosses we can do it in flies. Again, something we can't do in mouse, Alex, this like problem. Hundreds of progeny with the melanogaster recoded guys, but essentially a handful or no progeny with either the ancestor or with the simulans recoded guys. Keep in mind, these flies are perfectly fertile 
when crossed to melanogaster. They're just not capable of producing progeny when crossed to each other. And all of this can be rescued by a melanogaster rescue transgene. So I'll just quickly tell you that we do have evidence that these embryos are dying because of uh, mitotic uh, defects and division. This is just the uh, second to last slide. What we have is a beautiful array of synchronous divisions of nuclei in which these nuclei populate on the outer surface of these embryos. And so in the melanogaster guy, you can see these beautiful arrays of propidium iodide stained nuclei, which is exactly what you'd expect because there's very little uh, sort of mistakes made and any mistakes would actually show up in the interior of these. These are these ancestral recorded guys and I hope you can see there are pretty large gaping holes in some of these and these are actually nuclei that should have been at the periphery but made a mitotic error and basically ended up in the interior. Here's one that is much more severely affected. So essentially what this means is that these embryos from the, with, containing the melanogaster sid will nicely hatch into first and second and third instar and make adults, whereas these will basically never make it past the first instar stage of embryogenesis. So after all of that, what we ended up completely opposite, I would have lost a lot of money if I had bet on this, was it's actually early embryonic mitosis that suffers the consequences of centromedic DNA evolution and forces the centromedic histone to evolve in order to suppress those kinds of defects. So with that, I'll leave you with this sort of uh, hopefully enticing prospect that we think we have a very good explanation now for why centromeric proteins, despite being completely essential, are being forced on this treadmill of adaptation because of the rapid evolution, constant rapid evolution of uh, selfish centromeres. So thanks very much. I hear there's beer. But... Questions? Yes. So, to what extent does the uh, artificial selection induced by this, these selfish elements actually interfere with and contaminate the, the natural selection and, and kind of productive at it? Yeah, so that was my point with the slide with the Darwinian. So, in, in classical Darwinian fitness, you want the fitter alleles to win for the organism to get fitter over time. This is completely subverting that, right? So this is, a, this is a sort of a mercenary interested in its own fitness and it completely subverts the classical natural selection paradigm. So is there any theory about, about what Only in terms of inheritance. So the way we think about is that naturally fit alleles have a certain cadence of rising to fixation or high frequency. And in the presence of these guys, the cadence is completely ruined. And sometimes the cadence can never go to fixation, whereas they would have gone to fixation in the absence of selfish gene. It totally depends on what the selfish gene is linked to. If it's linked to a deleterious allele, you're not just dragging the selfish gene, you're dragging everything recombinationally linked to that selfish gene up in the population. And you can't really purge that uh, at close recombinational distances. So like with centromeres, you're not just dragging the centromere, you're dragging a large chunk of the genome with it because of the recombinational suppression. And so there's a very high risk of fixing or, or leading to high frequency of deleterious alleles in that kind of vicinity. Well, you could argue that the fission yeasts are like a radiation, right? I mean, you've got less than 0.5% identity, and we've made 10 random crosses of fission yeast strains, and they were all reproductively isolated from each other. The amazing thing, which I totally could not believe, is that in the 30 years of meiotic research in fission yeast, people have used exactly the same strain. Here? Okay. Oh, yeah, um, uh, we're interesting. So I have two questions. First, uh, in the dying embryos you showed at the last... Um, how do the centromere look like? Yeah, so we haven't, we don't have that yet. That, that picture is about four weeks old. We are setting up to do that with live imaging with H2A RFP. So we will be getting that through spinning disk. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, so, but I would infer that uh, at least one of the chromosomes is probably suffering uh, some sort of lagging chromosome behavior. We've only seen it anecdotally, and so I would not... I would not like you to take that as a conclusion. We, don't, we do not know the answer uh, to that right now. I have another quick question yeah. uh, regarding to your earlier uh, result. You showed these two transcripts, the shorter one encodes this poison. Yeah. 
uh, and the longer one is anti, uh, you know, contact with that. So what ensures the shorter transcript get expressed first? Uh, well, so that's, so people ask me this question all the time, but you hit upon it. Uh -huh. The mechanism of the poison and the antidote is actually not the interesting thing here. What's interesting is this cadence of transcription, because if the poison is expressed late, or the antidote is expressed early, this whole system collapses. So it's actually the invention of these two dual meiosis-specific early and late promoters, which is what is actually really driving the system, exactly. So we've expressed the poison out of context in mitosis, and it's a poison in mitosis also. And it's a poison also in cerevisia, and the antidote can protect against that. So there's nothing really magical about meiosis being susceptible to this poison. It's just that meiosis is the perfect place for this kind of selfish uh, element to manifest itself. Yeah. Or, uh, myotic drive playing an important role um, in increasing standing variation, like keeping deleterious alleles in the population that could be uh, selected when the environment changes. Yeah, so there's actually a number of studies, not from our lab, which have looked at overdominance, this idea that you're sort of keeping multiple alleles, both in flies as well as hu human populations. There's very little evidence in humans, but in flies there's whole chunks of things that are, quote, overdominant, where they are actually in medium frequency. A lot of people think that that's because of incompatibility, but I suspect that some of those are harboring these kinds of selfish genes. We are looking at one of those right now. Yeah. Well, we've, we've all heard of a lot of threatened species that just seem to have a difficult time keeping their population sizes from declining. And as you learn more about these elements, is there some way to detect them in more easily so that one could identify cases where perhaps an excessive amount of meiotic drive is blocking, you know, sele productive selection and is actually the reason some of these species are, are declining? Actually, male meiotic drive, like the WTF, is actually fairly easy to detect because it's a pretty gross fertility defect. Female meiotic drive, what makes it kind of cool is also that it's basically undetectable. Uh, maize knobs, because of the cytological markers, it was first detected in maize experiments. Um, but other kinds of selfish behavior, I suspect what you're referring to includes, for instance, Wolbachia infections. Um, and Wolbachia can basically, because of its male killing behavior in some monarch butterfly populations, there were some populations in which there was one male for every 10,000 females. And then the population acquired a suppressor. So you can imagine the selective coefficient if you were like the one lucky male that got the ability to defend Wolbachia. And that's, we see that. Greg Hurst has shown quite beautifully that that population in a matter of 12 years has gone from a acute paucity of males to almost a 50-50 ratio. So these kinds of cycles are very unlikely to be a re result of anything other than these kinds of selfish elements. Yeah. All right, so thank you for all the questions. And, uh...